The Gallian Foundation fosters, recognizes, and rewards excellence in scientific innovation to improve the human condition. André Malraux said once in one of his novels, Une vie humaine ne vaut rien, mais rien ne vaut une vie humaine. Human life is worth nothing, but nothing is worth a human life. All these men and women are trying to save human lives. Is there anything more noble than that? The Gallian Awards Ceremony is considered the equivalent of the Oscars Night for the innovators in the labs and awards every year Best Pharmaceutical Product, Best Biotechnology Product, Best Product for Orphan Rare Diseases, Best Medical Technology, Best Digital Health Solution, Best Incubator Accelerator Equity, Best Startup. Around the globe, the Prix Galleon is considered as the equivalent of the Nobel Prize for the industry mobilizing an unrivaled network of Nobel laureates and top biomedical scientists. The Galleon Foundation manages an independent, cross-functional and geographically diverse program of events and sponsorship to brand the best of the best in new medicines and diagnostics. The Prix Galleon is a welcome initiative to stimulate creative research and promote excellence. Barack Obama the Roy Vagelos Pro Bono Humanum Award for Global Health Equity is bestowed to an individual, a company, an academic institution, or a non-governmental agency that has helped to improve the human condition through the application of biopharmaceutical science to problems of developing or underserved populations worldwide. This is the right event, on the right issue, at the right time. Staging this event in Africa is a significant statement that science and innovation are needed as much here in Africa as anywhere else. I'm particularly grateful to receive this award. The awards are among the highest honors in science and commerce because they lead to improvement in the human condition. The pre gallian Awards recognize the world's brightest minds and most innovative companies. They are a true celebration of the hard work required to produce life-changing interventions. That is what makes us optimistic about the future. Congratulations to all of you. Make a difference. Join the Gallian Foundation. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our panel this morning. I am Kara Bradley. I'm a member of the Galleon Foundation's Executive Advisory Board. Thank you all so much for joining our panel this morning. Um, welcome to the Galleon Week of Innovation. Our webinar is here in New York, but we definitely have people calling in from all around the world here. Um, our objective this week is to provide additional content and background for the largest annual event, the Pre-Galleon USA Awards, will be held tomorrow here in New York on Thursday. We've developed this webinar series to give our nominees for the many, many categories um, some greater visibility in describing their journey of what brought them here today. And this year's awards, we have a record of 178 nominees for our seven categories. That's nearly 150 companies covering 15 diverse therapeutic areas, ranging from cancer, cardiology, neuroscience, infectious disease, rare disease, vaccines, we've got it all. Um, so in our best medical technology category, which is our focus here today, we are hosting three webinars due to the large number of products representing this very important field. In this special webinar in this hour, we have our three nominees, which our focus here is cancer devices and diagnostics. And what we're covering here today relates to the central question of what is medical technology innovation doing around the urgent need for a faster diagnosis and a more targeted yet less invasive treatments in the cancer space. 
So let's move right on into our discussion. I'd love to quickly introduce my esteemed panel here. I have David Webster, CEO of Body Vision Medical joining us. I have Tanya Rustick, our Executive Director of Olympus America Inc and David Brockman, the co-founder and CTO of GT Medical Technologies, Inc. Thank you all so much for joining me here this morning. I'd love to just quickly go around Robin here and let you all introduce yourselves, what brings you to our panel here today. And David Webster, I would love to start with you. Thank you, Kara. My name is David Webster. I'm the CEO of Body Vision, and we're the makers of uh, the Lung Vision System, which is an AI-driven uh, navigation and imaging solution that guides the uh, interventional pulmonologist, thoracic surgeons to the lesion in the lung so they can quickly and effectively obtain a, a biopsy, which then leads uh, into the next phase of, of lung cancer treatment, which is, uh, which is therapy. So delighted to be here and delighted to be part of this group and, uh, and you know, our big uh, push at Neurologica, or I'm sorry, Body Vision is to um, is is the de democratization of this med tech and really pushing it out to places that uh, don't have it. Great, thanks so much, David. Tanya, I'll toss it to you. Thank you. So, um, really thrilled to be here, Kara. Thank you so much, and thanks to the Galleon Foundation for um, this incredible ceremony that takes place each year, where we can talk about these innovations. Um, so I'm executive director of marketing for our respiratory division of the U.S., and I'm honored to be able to present our BFUC-190F endobronchial ultrasound scope. Um, there are a variety of ways to diagnose and stage lung cancer. Um, the current guidelines and standard of care dictate that a procedure called ebis tbna which is endobronchial, endobronchial ultrasound with transbronchial needle, as needle aspiration, is the best first test. Um, to diagnose and disease stage. And Olympus is proud to have pioneered this technology, uh, making this important diagnostic and staging technology, which is minimally invasive, um, available worldwide. That's great. Thank you so much. And David Brockman. Well, hi, um, I'm David Brockman. I'm a uh, uh, founder of GT Medical and, and uh, named author on all of our patents. And and basically at GT Medical, our focus is on improving the lives of uh, brain tumor patients. And uh, we are uh, pioneering a new form um, of radiation therapy, something that is done from the inside at the time of surgery. Uh, historically, as you may know, the radiation treatment has been done uh, with something called external beam radiation. This is given from the outside, exposing uh, large amounts of tissue, whether it be brain or, in, or in similarly in other parts of the body to unnecessary uh, injury and is expensive and has to be postponed for several weeks after surgery to allow for tissue and, and other transited tissue healing. Um, in contrast with what we do, uh, something called known as brachytherapy, which is a, actually a 105 or 10 year old historical form um, of, of radiation, the first form. But uh, old things are new again, and this uses a self contained biocompatible uh, low energy uh, um, device that is soft and pliable and implanted at the time of surgery. And I'm gonna go off uh, camera for one, go off a blur for one moment so people can actually see what this looks like. And, and this is put to line a tumor cavity at the time of surgery it adds about five minutes to the procedure and is self-adherent and stays with the patient. And that's a gamma talk. Thank you. Well, thank you all for your introductions and Thank you all for joining us today on this panel. And I do have a few questions I'd love to start with, but I'd also love to flag to our audience that if you do have any questions throughout this, please feel free to drop them into the Q&A and we will get to them throughout our discussion. So first I'd love to ask, um, why did your company choose to focus on the specific disease state and indication associated with the product? Um, David Webster, I'd love to start with you on that one. Sure. So when you look at uh, deaths associated with cancer, we hear a lot about prostate, we hear a lot about breast, we hear a lot about colorectal. Well, the truth of the matter is when you add all three of those up, they don't equal the number of people that, uh, that succumb to lung cancer. So lung cancer is, is a tremendous problem. We in the United States have the best survival rate at five years with 21%. That drops off precipitously as you leave the United States. So the, the need that we saw was twofold. First of all, 
a, an easily deployable, uh, uh, cost-effective way to assist the surgeon in navigating to the lesion and taking the biopsy, right? But the bigger picture is something that isn't just a solution in the United States or developed countries that have access to the best medical technology, technology that we could easily push out to the rest of the world. And, and clearly, if you look at the, the lung diagnosis space, what the rest of the world has relative to what the more advanced uh, med tech countries have, there's a tremendous disparity. So that's, that's the need that we saw, and that's what we uh, seek to, to solve with, uh, with lung vision. That is great, thank you. And Tanya, I'll ask you the same. Why did Olympus choose to focus on the disease state and indication associated with your nominated product here? Absolutely. Well, you know, David, I think did a great job talking about how, you know, lung cancer kills more than breast prostate um, and, and colon cancer combined. And we hear a lot more about those cancers, uh, interestingly enough. But, um, you know, Olympus has had a long legacy in the respiratory and pulmonary space. You know, during my introduction, I had mentioned that Olympus had pioneered EBIS tBNA, which is now uh, the guideline recommended best first test for lung cancer diagnosis and staging. Um, so we've got a real legacy in this space. And, you know, as part of this legacy um, in fighting the world's sort of most deadly cancer, we developed our next generation EBIS bronchoscope, which is the UC-190. Um, the bronchoscope had some pretty significant innovations in terms of having a more compact design, more distal tip, uh, and a variety of other features that are really intended to help the physician get deeper into the lung for their diagnosis and staging. So when a physician um, diagnoses and stages lung cancer with EBIS TBNA, what's going to end up happening is they will have had some sort of a nodule um, become present, either in an incidental finding, maybe they had a car accident or they're suspected of having pneumonia, um, and they get a chest CT and something suspicious is found. Um, there's also a, a burgeoning program, prophylactic screening, uh, lung cancer screening, which is really just in its infancy. Um, in the US, but we expect to kind of have a, a significant growth over the years to come and, and be very similar to like what a colonoscopy has become for colon cancer. Um, but in either of those instances, you know, you find this potential nodule um, as cancers are earlier in their stage, they're more peripheral, meaning they're more closer to the chest wall as opposed to be close, being closer to the central airway. Um, and what is done during an EBIS procedure um, is the lymph nodes, the mediastinal or chest lymph nodes are sampled in a systematic way. Um, and the basically the, the gist of it is the farther away malignant cells are found um, in that lymph node pattern, the farther away from the lesion, um, the, the higher the stage of the cancer. And what's so unique about the procedure is that you can not only diagnose, but you can also stage in the exact same procedure. Um, and that's so important because an appropriate stage is really what's gonna dictate the success of, of downstream therapies. So, um, you know, we're fortunate, according to ECRI data, the majority of pulmonologists in the U.S. do EBIS TBNA with an Olympus bronchoscope, um, and that's a partnership we definitely don't take lightly here at Olympus. So we continue to strive to provide our highly skilled physicians uh, with innovative, reliable, and efficient tools, um, and continuing to iterate and develop the next generation of EBIS TBNA, and, and that's how we ended up with the current generation that we recently launched. That is fascinating. Thank you. And David Brockman, how um, and why did GT uh, Medical Technologies choose to focus on the, the disease state and indication associated with your nominated product? Well, um, you know, this is a very good tie in with our, our other panelists, which is uh, in the U.S. alone. Um, and, and unfortunately, brain tumors are very common and very lethal. And in, in the U.S. alone, for brain metastases, uh, the majority of which come from lung cancer, sadly, there were about 250,000 new diagnoses in, in 2022. And in terms of primary brain tumors, things like glioblastoma, meningioma, other malignant tumors, there were about 84,000 new diagnoses. Um, this puts about a million people every year at risk, either because of new or possibly recurrent tumor. And after brain surgery, which is an amazing uh, uh, technology these days, um, tumor recurrence is still very common. And adjuvant radiation is, is routinely prescribed. Um, historically, it has been done using large, uh, complicated machinery, uh, very uh, expensive to obtain for centers, um, decentralized uh, 
uh, to a degree, but not enough that patients often have to travel far for this therapy. And uh, we saw an unmet need in terms of both uh, efficacy for brain tumor treatment and um, access to care. Um, uh, I have relatives in um, my wife's family in Bangladesh. Uh, they have no linear accelerators, which is the technology we use to treat uh, brain and extracranial tumors today with radiation. Um, gamma tile, in contrast, is a, is a self-contained device placed at the time of uh, brain surgery. It's a biocompatible, it stays in place, um, it's manufactured per patient, and it currently adds less than five minutes, actually less than about three minutes to the procedure. Um, I did show a, a quick view of what this looks like, but the point being that this is placement in the operating room makes this a one and done procedure for patients and their families. Um, no additional trips and no additional uh, uh, equipment or expertise is needed beyond what is present in the operating room. And um, very, very importantly, the side effects don't really take place away from the, the uh, site of um, placement. These side effects can seem trivial at first, perhaps hair loss or fatigue, which if you're the patient are not, and all the way to cognitive changes and, and specific organ injury. And each of these aspects contributes to gamma tile being a, a quality of life and outcomes game changer for patients with brain tumors. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you all for bringing some insight into what brings you here today and why your product is nominated for this esteemed award. Mm -hmm. I'd love to ask, what's been the clinician and patient response to the products this far? And if there's any measurable impact you can cite on any clinical outcomes for the patients with this product as well. David Webster, I'll start with you. So in the lung cancer continuum of care, there's really four buckets. Detection, which is more associated with what Tanya said with the pre-op CT that discovers the, the, the lesion in the lung. Then there's diagnosis, moving into treatment and treatments evolving to targeted treatment. So instead of doing a full resection or a partial resection of the lung, the future of, of treatment is targeted therapy, whether it's with a form of ablation or a biologic or a pharmacological solution, and then their survivorship. So uh, currently, uh, the way we measure success uh, in the diagnostic realm is a term called diagnostic yield. And that means uh, when, a, when a, a doctor goes after the lesion, what level of success that they do they have? Okay, and this diagnostic uh, category is bucketed in sort of three areas. One is what what Tanya is talking about: a bronchoscope with an ultrasound system, which helps to gu guide the doctor to the, once the doctor gets the lesion, helps them better uh, in, ensure that they're getting into the uh, tumor that they're looking for and get the diagnostic yield. Um, then there's the uh, robotic platforms, or which which are much more advanced. Uh, they're very costly. They have proprietary consumables that the doctor has to use, which sort of puts it out of the reach. So when you look at the gap, there's a huge gap between what a bronchoscope can do in the hands of a skilled surgeon and what a robot does. Uh, what we do at Body Vision is we enhance the performance of the surgeon. So a surgeon with a standard bronchoscope or, or, or a rebus or, uh, system, we boost their diagnostic yield to greater than 90%, which is sort of the gold standard that everyone is looking for, both to confirm or deny the malignancy of the tumor, but secondarily uh, to deliver targeted therapy. So for us, it was diagnostic yield and our clinical papers show that whether they're using uh, body vision with a robotic platform or with a standard bronchoscope, we can elevate that diagnostic yield to the high, high 80s and low 90s routinely. And we've demonstrated that numerous times uh, in, in numerous papers. So that's what we're focused on. The response from the, the clinicians has been great because uh, it's either feast or famine. And what do I mean is either they're a scope user with no access to that technology because of the cost and, uh, and the robotic platform and, and, and vice versa. So uh, the response from the clinicians has been great. And then of course, when you look at the quintuple aim, the faster and min more minimally invasive you can get those results, the better it is for the patient, right? Outpatient procedure, there's not a lot of healing that has to happen. And the clinician gets the information they need on the first uh, pass. So the response has been uh, has been great for us. That is fantastic. Thank you. Tanya, I'll ask you the same. Thank you. So um, 
yeah, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's really neat that, that, uh, you know, I have someone who's in a, a similar space to us on, on this panel. So that's, that's kind of exciting. Um, so, you know, with Eva's TBNA, um, the response from clinicians has been such that it's now a guideline recommended best first test. Um, however, despite that, you know, there's, there's a great number of patients who are still only being staged through clinical imaging. Um, so let's say they might do a CT guided TTNA um, or some other procedure to sample the lesion um, itself, which is typically more in the outside part of the lung. And then to find the stage, they're just getting a PET CT. Um, and, and the radiologist or the physician or the oncologist is looking at that and determining lymph node involvement from that. However, um, there have been numerous studies citing that, um, you know, when you look at a pathologic or sampling method versus clinical staging, where they're just looking at images, they often disagree. So that's why it's so incredibly important that the mediastinal lymph nodes are, are sampled. So typically in a procedure, what will happen is um, the PET CT will, will notice something of concern, which will then prompt a referral to the pulmonologist. The pulmonologist will do a procedure in the Bronx suite, either under conscious sedation, or they may choose to do general anesthesia. Either are options with EBUS. Um, and then they'll do that lymph node sampling in a specific pattern uh, in the mediastinum. And what that will do is if malignant tissue is found, um, no further procedure is, is necessarily needed. You can stop there. Um, I know my colleague David talked about diagnostic yield. You know, EBIS really was kind of the, the trendsetter in terms of the diagnostic yield of being in the mid 80s um, for, for just that procedure alone. And once that tissue is obtained, additional can be obtained for next generation sequencing for genetic specific therapies for lung cancer. And then it also informs the stage of where um, the patient will go next. And I'm sure you can imagine that getting an accurate stage is so important to the efficacy of the downstream treatment, right? Um, you don't want to have something that is too aggressive um, for the actual TNN stage that you might have, because then you're going to have more side effects than you necessarily may need. Um, but certainly at the same time, you don't want something that isn't aggressive enough or isn't equally matched to the stage of your deep disease progression, because of, the, of course, that can also have some negative effects um, on your long-term health as well. So, um, you know, EBIS as a procedure um, has been widely accepted, certainly in the U.S. Over 1,600 clinical studies globally have been performed. Um, and I would say the fact that it's included in the ACCP guidelines is probably a good indication of, of its acceptance into the physician's practice. Wonderful. Thank you. And David Brockman, I'll ask you the same. What's been the clinician and patient response? And if there's any measurable impact um, that you can share with us for clinical outcomes for patients, that would be fantastic. So uh, Gamatil was uh, initially cleared for use in recurrent brain tumors in 2018. Um, we went commercial uh, in basically the very start of the pandemic, who knew, uh, and received uh, an expanded indication in 2020 um, so that it's now available for use in all newly diagnosed tumors as well. Um, it's covered by insurance plans. Uh, we've applied for guidelines as a newer therapy. Uh, we believe we'll find them soon, um, but that's, that's one of those things. And we've had the honor of treating over 1,200 patients at 100 institutions. And basically, um, they're used to line the tumor bed immediately following the resection of the tumor. And therefore, the tumor really doesn't have an ad added few weeks to grow. Uh, the patients are able to go about their days. Um, and the tumor burden is treated when it's at the lowest uh, physical point. Um, it also doesn't extend the hospital stay beyond that needed for surgery. And, and in fact, uh, there are no additional radiation protections uh, required because every patient has below, been below the radiation threshold for um, additional safety. So basically the reception has been really, really good, um, patients and users. In addition to the commercial activity, we've had about 30 peer-reviewed publications on gamma tile in the last three years um, in brain metastases. Uh, again, the majority of these being lung. Um, there have been three prospective single institutions published and three similarly for glioblastoma and all are remarkably consistent with tumor control at or above the historical uh, norms, um, uh, fewer side effects, patient quality of life impact, um, the long-term data uh, is just as it sounds uh, being developed. We have two ongoing randomized multi-center controlled trials in brain metastases. One is 
led by Andy Anderson and the other by Memorial Sloan Kettering, respectively. One's in upfront brain metastases, newly diagnosed, the second in recurrent. Um, they're progressing very nicely. And we have one trial in newly diagnosed glioblastoma um, that was designed with uh, Dr. Roger Stoop of the Stroop Protocol, uh, named known to neuro-oncologists, and one uh, RCT about to open in recurrent GBM. So we, we really do think that we're uh, in a good position for helping patients for, for moving forward um, with what could be uh, a very effective uh, treatment in the sense of um, we're doing more with less, we don't require specialized equipment, and we're lowering the burden of care currently borne by healthcare facilities, uh, patients, and their families uh, compared to the legacy radiation methods. Thanks. Thank you for sharing. And I know coming here today, sitting on this webinar, having a product nominated for a pre Gallian award couldn't have been so simple and so easy. Um, I'd love to ask if there was any challenges that your companies confronted um, in transitioning from an early proof of concept to human subject testing and ultimately to market authorization. And David Webster, I'll start with you. Yeah, thank you. I think it starts with what's the core focus of the company, especially a smaller company when you're starting it out and you have limited resources and limited reach. And at, uh, at Body Vision, our, our core focus is saving lives through democratization of innovative medical technology. So our technology can be looked at as disruptive. Now, the definition of disruptive technology has many meanings to different people. The obvious one is, hey, we're doing uh, something in a new way <coughs> that challenges traditional practices. And that certainly is part of disruptive technology. But I think the bigger part of it is, is changing cost structures, right? So I think one of the most challenging things for us is, you know, we very quickly proved that it could work and we proved that it was uh, easy to incorporate and we proved that anybody could use it and you could use your existing technology and insert this and make it better, right? I think the challenge was, and the challenge remains, is that we are challenging the existing cost structure, okay? Now, outside the United States, that's incredibly important because the, many of the uh, medical systems that we deal with are socialized medicine, and they simply don't have the amount of money that we do. In the U.S., it's, uh, they argue that, uh, the, that medical care is 18% of the GDP. That's an enormous amount of money. So we have access to the best medical care, the most elaborate, complex medical equipment that's available. What we strove to do is make something, uh, make a device, make a piece of equipment that, that solves a need, but more importantly, can be implemented by everyone. It doesn't matter what size hospital you are, where you're geographically located, what resources that you, are, uh, that you have at your disposable for everyone. So the biggest challenge for us in adoption is getting through the noise with the doctors where they're, they're being told by, by bigger companies with more complex systems that this is the way you have to do it and sort of uh, um, uh, diminishing the value of a, a startup product like this because we're challenging the cost structures, right? But I think for the future of medicine, if we're going to keep it under control and we're really going to push great medicine out to the rest of the world, we have to have disruptive technologies that challenge cost structures and lower the costs. So for us, that's been uh, the biggest challenge. Clinically, uh, uh, it, was, it was very straightforward in how we accomplished it, but the big challenge now is getting in front of the clinicians, cutting through the noise and showing them there's a simpler, more inexpensive way to do it with similar outcomes. Great, thank you. Tanya, I'll ask you the same. Yeah, thank you. So, um, you know, I would say it takes a couple of different forms, right? So um, certainly when, when you have a product that's well-loved and you want to make a successor and iterate on that and make it better, um, you know, making sure that you can do so in a way that meets physician needs, that is durable, long-lasting. Um, you know, Olympus has a reputation of, of once you purchase a scope from Olympus, it lasts for quite a long time. Um, so whatever we come out with sort of needs to live up to that expectation. So I would say making sure that it as that durability often takes a lot of testing from us. Um, and I would say that that's always a challenge to make sure that we're living up to that legacy. Um, interestingly enough, Olympus has gone through a pretty significant um, evolution in the past couple of years um, in the form of, you know, most people know Olympus as a camera company and or a microscope company. 
And interestingly enough, you know, Olympus strategically decided over the previous couple of years to divest both of those businesses um, so that it could focus solely on medical technology. And within the medical technology business, um, you know, Olympus named three procedural areas or clinical areas that it wanted to focus on where it saw the most growth and opportunity, both in terms of unmet needs globally, as well as, you know, alignment with our core competencies. And that really came down to um, GI, urology, and respiratory. Um, so we're very fortunate to get this kind of global focus from um all the way from the top, especially as we are now sort of coming out as a pure play med tech company. So that's been a lot of change. Um, it's been a lot of change internally, but I'm really pleased to say that, you know, that level of focus has enabled us to provide innovation in terms of new product releases, as well as um, some really dedicated support for our customers in pulmonary, which is, you know, hearkening back to what David said with the incidence of lung cancer is a huge area. Um, and with lung cancer screening, just sort of being in its infancy, um, the need for hospitals and clinicians to be able to have an effective way to reliably um, and minimally invasively diagnose and stage is just going to be more important than ever. So we're proud to be one of the three focus areas for, for Olympus corporate in our new pure play med tech business. And um, we really look forward to the future for sure. That's fantastic. Thank you. And David Brockman, I'll ask you the same. I, you know, my panelists have, have covered it really well. Um, I think that uh, I would just simply rephrase it as for us, particularly, it's it's the burden of history. Um, and, and that swings both ways. Um, history in terms of uh, brachytherapy, uh, it, it was very old. It was first started in the brain in the 1930s. Um, like a lot of things in the 1930s, good concept and bad reality. Um, it it gave way for brain tumor treatment and uh, like other things to linear accelerators in the in the 60s and 70s and 80s. And they've been wonderful engineering solutions, but they're hugely expensive, very costly to to get into, very difficult on patients but we have the history of, of the legacy product. Um, legacy products have um, known outcomes that, that were not known at first, but developed over many years. Um, by the same token, we are a radiation product. We're not a, a new molecule. People know what the outcomes ought to be. If you have a tighter uh, uh, treatment radius and uh, uh, similar, what we call dosing, um, you expect good outcomes. And, and I think we've been given that. The other history we have is of physicians, particularly in America, um, not working together. Um, this this may come as a shock to people on the panel uh, and, and maybe the Galleon Foundation, but not everybody communicates as well as they should. And the best outcomes for patients are collaborative. And that's absolutely true for what we do. We, we have to have people who uh, have a collaborative environment and in our hundred programs we set up to date. This is first and foremost, this is a team sport. And uh, and works best for the patient and then the teams if you talk about it. And then, and then lastly, uh, the history in fact is um, the healthcare systems. And as was pointed out, um, people are not incentivized yet in this country for efficient care. Uh, to have a therapy that takes the place of an externally given outpatient facility, um, CapEx thing, moves it inside, um, is not rewarded the way it ought to be uh, because people have um, invested in long-term brick and mortar structures that, you know, how are we going to pay it off? Where's the return? Where's the ROI for our hospital and our investors? The answer is, I'm really sorry, but at certain points you have to put patients first and foremost. And, and uh, if that sounds uh, frustrating, um, I'm just a, an accidental um, entrepreneur. I, and I, try to hold my colleagues to a higher standard sometimes, but it, it doesn't always work out. And I will stop there. <laughs> no, thank you. It's that old saying, there's no I in team. It really, it, it, it plays a part in any industry here. And I'd love to just take yeah. a moment to re remind our audience members, if you have any questions, please feel free to drop them into the Q&A and I will ask our esteemed panelists here. Um, but I do have another question here. If we're looking five, 10 years down the line, um, what contributions do you think your companies will be making to the fight against cancer five to 10 years from now? David Webster, I'll start with you. 
So as, um, as a company that focuses on AI and enhancing the performance of, of uh, human potential as opposed to replacing it like what a robot does, um, I think AI is going to play a tremendous uh, role in cancer. I think it's going to start with uh, looking at everything from, from therapy interactions and, and modeling and predicting outcomes. I think it's also going to be part of correlating data that otherwise wasn't correlated in the past where we're looking for causality in cancer. And then finally, in what we're doing is just enhancing the performance of procedures, helping to make it make them faster, minimally invasive, um, in improving the performance and the outcomes in general. So, so for what we're doing with AI, I, I really think AI is in the future, is the future. I know a lot of people are scared of it. I know a lot of people are talking about the downside of AI, but there's so much more upside to it uh, when it's used appropriately. Uh, and that's, that's where I think uh, our contribution lies. We're, we're on the cutting edge of, of AI implementation in medicine, and it's only going to increase. And, it's, and AI will improve healthcare uh, around the world, which very few things can have that monumental impact on, on, on human life. That is so true. Thank you. Tanya, same to you. Thanks. So, you know, so much, I, I happen to agree about AI, David. So I, I do think that the applications of AI in a variety of ways, um, both from maybe like a decision support perspective for physicians during the procedure, all the way through to like algorithmic, algorithmic modeling, um, population health screening, all those different things, I think are going to be areas where AI is going to be able to help us. Um, you know, another piece I think that's going to be really key in the next five to 10 years is taking real-time sampling, you know, further and deeper into the periphery of the lung. So uh, one of the reasons why EBIS TBNA has the diagnostic yield that it has is because you're going to, you're watching the sampling tool, which is the needle, go into the lesion or lymph node in real time under direct visualization. You're watching it go in, which is why it's, you know, traditionally, um, a bit more easy to use and a bit more straightforward than something where you're using like a virtual map um, and an approximation of where a lesion may be to, to puncture and sample. Um, and there's a variety of, of, you know, sampling modalities and, and different options to do either of those things right now. But I think taking that further into the lung is really going to be a game changer. Um, and whether that takes the form of EBUS or it takes the form of something else, um, I think still remains to be seen, but that direct visualization is going to be so important, not only for sampling, but also, you know, as we think about the ultimate dream of pulmonology, which is to say, you might have cancer, let's do this procedure. And then, you know, some period of time later, the pulmonologist wakes the patient up and says, you had cancer, I treated it, and you don't anymore. Um, I think that's the holy grail of where everybody would eventually love to get to. Um, being able to direct directly visualize wherever you are either ablating or, or doing whatever you're doing, I think it's going to be really important to the efficacy ultimately of being able to get to that dream. So real-time sampling and direct visualization in the periphery is going to be kind of the, the next frontier, I think, in the next five to 10 years, in addition to either decision support or other algorithmic support from AI. Thank you. And David Brockman, tell us the future, please, five to 10 years from now. <laughs> Well, we were established and are completely focused on improving the lives of patients with brain tumors. Um, but as we kind of discussed, brain tumors aren't just uh, brain tissue. And we've found and uh, completely established that it's very good for lung cancer metastases, breast tumor metastases. Uh, we've had eradication of pancreas and other things. And the point is, is, is this is sort of a market strategy at first, um, but for extracranial uh, applications, um, we've done uh, clinical work in head and neck cancer, uh, cadaver work in spine tumors. Uh, people are very interested in, um, as I said, things like pancreatic cancer. There is nothing about radiation that is, is tumor specific currently. So um, that's one approach. The other is, is that we're just in a US market, which is 4% uh, of the world population. 
And there is a growing need to be able to do more with less as things move forward into the world. And, and in fact, um, we do have uh, plans for uh, and, and patent protection across the, the portions of the globe that allow uh, our useful patent protection. So um, we think that this is a technology that could be useful, both extracranial and, and outside of the U.S. and, and look forward to, to helping people uh, with that. Fantastic. Um, so what excites um, all of you most about the prospects for progress in making the cancer journey better for patients? We've thought about the future, but what excites you in the current current landscape of what we're looking at today? David Webster, I'll start with you. I think for me in, in the lung cancer space is really hope, hope for the patients. Um, I lost my father to complications of lung cancer, and that was five years ago. And he was fortunate enough that it was caught at late stage, but there was enough technology and therapy available in the Boston area where he was able to beat the curve and uh, be one of the 20% that survived beyond five years. Um, and when, you, when you're close to a lung cancer patient like that, um, you know, there's this innate sense of hopelessness. So I think one of the messages that we have to get out to society in general is that lung cancer is not necessarily a death sentence anymore. And every year that passes and every year that medical technology and other therapies are, are uh, introduced, the probability of survival increases. So in particular, our biggest challenge at the moment, I think, is detection. It's the willingness of lung cancer, uh, of people who are prone to lung cancer for whatever reason to go out there and get the screening. And if you talk to many of them, because of this sense of hopelessness, they don't even see a reason to get the, the scan because they don't, it's almost like they don't want to know until the very end. And that was my father's attitude. But what we need to get across to them is that there are so many more therapies at stage one, two, three, that you should hunt for the bad news because hunting for the bad news means detection. Detection means diagnosis and access to this new technology that's improving diagnosis, which then leads to therapy. And so many more people could survive. And, and what I would tell you is the reason that that hope is so important to me is with my father, we got another five years of, 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 of time with him. And it made all the difference. He got to see my son go to college and he got to see a whole bunch of things happen that he wouldn't have. So for me, it's hope. It's, it's letting people is encouraging this type of development, encouraging this type of progress, not for the sake of the money which is important to run companies, not for the sake of, of just developing new things. It's giving people hope and in turn, uh, giving hope to them in, in, in their families and increasing their lives, which will hopefully lead to, 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 to positive things. That's a beautiful sentiment. Thank you. Tanya, I will pass it to you. What excites you most about the prospect for progress? You know, I, it's a couple of things, right? So I would definitely agree with David about the idea of increasing lung cancer screening. Um, you know, for those who are on this call, if you take away one thing from this, um, it's it's to talk to your friends and family and loved ones about the importance of lung cancer screening. Less than 10% of the folks who should be getting screened are. Um, and CMS just expanded and the United Preventative Task Force just expanded its recommendations of who should get screened. It went from about 8 million people to a little over 14 million people um, in the U.S. alone, who should be getting screened for lung cancer. And we're not doing a great job of getting those folks through um, the screening procedure for a variety of reasons, one of which, David, to your point is, you know, folks don't want to know, um, or they feel like maybe if they smoked at some point in their life, they did this to themselves. There's a variety of emotional things that come into that. But really, you know, it's so exciting to see that there is something that we can do to catch this at an earlier stage and with education and awareness that we can um, that we can move that forward. You know, Olympus has partnered with the American Lung Association. We're really proud to do that to try to increase uh, lung cancer screening um, for this very reason. The other thing that I'll say is really exciting, you know, as, as I said, Olympus has a long legacy in pulmonary. And for a very long time, pulmonary medicine was not necessarily um, glossy or, or sexy, right? Um, and now with all of these companies coming into the space with all of this new information or new innovation, 
pulmonary is really beginning to to get its rightful due um, as being on the front lines of the fight against lung cancer. And there are so many new and exciting inter interventions um, with as it relates to diagnosis and, and staging that are coming in that are really putting the pulmonologist sort of on the, the cutting edge of, of the fight against lung cancer. And I honestly think that innovation in a space like this from anywhere is, is a great thing. Um, and I think it makes everybody up their game and be better. So I'm very excited about the, the innovations that are happening all across the space within pulmonary medicine and interventional pulmonology um, in the part in in the fight against lung cancer. I mean, it's with with that much with that many players in the game and that many new ideas circulating up circulating around that great things are bound to happen. Um, and I think that only benefits patients. Wonderful. Thank you. And David Brockman, I will ask you the same. It's hard following Tanya and David. It really is. Um, <laughs> and, and the answer, and, and I was, uh, once upon a time, I was an internist in the public health service in Chicago and um, went back and retrained in, in kind of what I do now, but not, not really. And the point is, is upstream is exactly where you want to be for all of these illnesses to make a huge impact. I mean, it really does. Um, to, to, you know, get, get onto that as well though, I think it's never been easier, never been easier, yes, never been easier is the right phrase, to collaborate. There are so many, um, Zooms, for example, have, have just, you know, the unintended benefit of the pandemic is we can reach out and touch someone uh, in a meaningful way as a collaborator and never really have to go meet them, right? Um, there are so much data available and an AI is helping us sift through that. I just think that it's, it's one of those things where if we could just, slow up long enough to understand what the guy in the room next to us is doing, um, we would make, and, and again, we're trying to be as collaborative we can and, and GT Medical, but it, it needs to, as you guys, I saw some head nods cross across all the, the spheres. Um, so I think both upstream and then today among people who know things that others don't know, and let's just stomp this out. Let's just get rid of it all. And I appreciate the help. Fantastic. My lovely panel, it has been such a pleasure hearing from all of you today, hearing a little bit more about your background and how you came about to sit on this panel today to speak about your pre-Galleon nominated products. I would like to thank you all so much for your participation and your time for um, joining this panel. I would like to thank the audience for their participation, listening in to this incredible voices who shared background that I think we can all take some notes away as we look towards a brighter and better future for cancer patients. Um, I'd like to mention that this webcast will be available on the Galleon Foundation's homepage in the coming weeks at galleonfoundation.org. And I'd also like to highlight again tomorrow our Galleon Forum beginning at 7.30 a.m. where there will be a ton of interesting panels um, ranging from a CEO roundtable and there'll also be a presentation of the 2023 Roy Vagelos Pro, Batum, Pro Bono Humanum Award. And then at 6.30 p.m. will be followed by the Pre-Galleon Awards Dinner at the American Museum of Natural History. So we're looking forward to an exciting day tomorrow for the Galleon Foundation. And again, my panel here today, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. And I hope everyone has a fantastic day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.